All right, so we're up to chapter 10 now in Joseph Campbell's uh, first volume of The Masks of God, uh, Primitive Mythology. Chapter 10 is called Mythological Thresholds of the Neolithic, and it's the last major chapter in the volume, followed just by uh, a conclusion. And um, this will probably take about two videos to go through this chapter. Uh, what he does here is he goes through the historical transformations uh, of myth, of what he calls mythogenetic zones over time. Uh, and he, start, he starts off first by uh, quoting this myth. Uh, the, subsection, the first subsection is called the Great Serpent of the Earliest Planters. And um, it's about a young woman. This comes from the Admiralty Islands uh, from the Indonesian area. It's an Indonesian myth. Uh, and it's a young woman who goes into the forest and she meets there a serpent uh, who claims that he wants to be her husband. He says, come on, I want you to be my bride. She says, well, you're a snake. I can't marry a snake. She says, he says, I have the form of a snake, but I have the speech of a man. So come on, let's go get married. So they go off and marry. Uh, and then they have two children, a boy and a girl. And the serpent tells her, he says, uh, I'm going to go ahead and take care of them. You can go ahead and leave. So she does this. She leaves. And... Uh, the serpent is there raising uh, his children, and one day he says, go catch some fish. So they go out and they catch some fish, um, and the serpent says, aren't you going to eat it? And they wait for the rays of the sun to rise up and warm it, and then they eat it. And he says, you need fire. And he tells the boy, he says, you need to go down into my belly and find the fire and pull it out and bring it forth. And so the boy is frightened by this, but he does it anyway. The serpent opens his jaws, and the boy goes inside um, note that that, by the way, is the inverse image of the way it appears in Mesoamerican civilization, where you always get, like with the Aztec eagle warriors, for instance, they're always wearing costumes with open jaws uh, of an animal, a jaguar, an eagle, where, from out of the gullet of which peers a human face. Uh, because in that civilization, the transpersonal has been swallowed up. The personal has been swallowed up and absorbed by transpersonal energies. So the boy goes down inside of him, finds the fire, brings it out, hunts some more fish, and this time they cook it, uh, and they eat it. And the serpent asks him, he says, which did you prefer? Did you prefer it uh, raw, or do you prefer it cooked? And the boy says, definitely prefer it cooked. So this little myth uh, that comes out of Indonesia, Campbell quotes as a kind of very uh, stripped-down version of the basic mythologum of the serpent and the maiden, uh, which is a core myth that he thinks uh, originated somewhere along this equatorial culture zone that extends from West Africa, goes across through the southern tip of India, and goes on into Polynesia. And he thinks the myth originated somewhere in there, but he just, he's not sure where. But he comes up with this concept of what he calls in this chapter mythogenetic zones. And mythogenetic zones are zones in which, uh, in a certain geographical area, a certain type of myth springs up, and it can spring up spontaneously in a number of locations at the same time, uh, who knows by what laws. And so he makes a distinction between a mythogenetic zone that's located in a specific geographical location and a diffusion zone, a zone by way of which uh, the originating nuclear myth has been transported by peoples on the move. Um, and so he says, so for this myth about the serpent and the maiden, we have this zone, this equatorial zone, but he says actually can be divided, subdivided into two separate zones, a zone that extends from Africa to uh, southern India, and then another zone uh, which extends from north and central India and goes across down through southeast Asia to Melanesia, and ultimately, of course, across the Pacific. Uh, and he says that it's likely that this myth, the mythologum of the serpent and the maiden, originated somewhere in this zone, uh, most likely in the zone from Africa to India. Uh, somewhere in that area. And then uh, what he does then is he goes through a series of stages of the rise of, high civiliz of civilization out of this basic Neolithic world in six distinct stages. Each one of these stages uh, has a different mythogenetic zone where different kinds of myths emerged and then spread. And then so he goes back through history and he, now he starts at the base of history and then goes forward from this point chronologically. He goes all the way back in stage one to the Australopithecines, which at this point he's still calling Plesianthropus, which is the old term for Australopithecines, uh, which date nowadays from about 4 million years ago to about 2.5 million years ago. Lucy, uh, the most famous Australopithecine, dates from about 3.2 million years ago. 
uh, we don't know anything about the religious mentality uh, or what mythogenetic zones would have come out of the Australopithecine mentality. There just simply isn't any evidence for it. And I think this zone, um, he doesn't say much about it, but I think it would, it would correspond nicely with Gene Gebser's archaic consciousness structure uh, from out of which the magical, later the mythical, then the rational, and finally the integral emerge as a series of mutations. But this would be the base level, I think, uh, this Australopithecine uh, zone in Africa. Uh, but the second zone gets a little more interesting, uh, where he skips ahead to Homo erectus, who, as we have seen, originated in Africa somewhere around 1.8 million years ago. And he says there are, um, and this is the first fellow, as we have seen, that migrates out of Africa. And there's a distribution uh, of two separate, what might become basic mythogenetic motifs. One is the Oshelian hand axe, as we have seen, the hand axe that is divinely superfluous. Uh, more beautiful than needs to be to satisfy any economic requirement, and so probably most likely had a ritual or symbolic use, which extends from Africa to India. So it covers that zone in there. Uh, but then with Southeast Asia, uh, the technology is based mostly on the same types of industries that we saw with Homo habilis, crude pebble chopper type old Dawan industries. But in that zone, in the Southeast Asian and Polynesian zone, going across the Pacific, um, he points out that fire is typically associated with the goddess, as with uh, the Ainu. It was originally thought that fire was domesticated in, in China with Shoko Tien, but now we know that it did originate with Homo erectus, but that it came out of Africa. Um, but nonetheless, we still have this, these two dis distribution zones of the hand axe, which may have been symbolic of the thunderbolt hurled by the Zeus or the Indra or the Thor type divinity. And then this fact that in the second zone that extends from uh, north and central India across the Pacific, fire generally is associated with a goddess, as amongst the Ainu, where she is known as the goddess of the hearth, Fuji, most likely after whom Mount Fujiyama is named. Uh, the fire goddess, also we have Pele in Hawaii, the mistress or goddess of Mount Kilauea there. And um, in Japan, the sun is female, Amaterasu, we have this, the sun goddess there. And uh, in a number of places, the sun actually is female, whereas the moon is male. Uh, in Germany, for example, the, to this day, the, the, die Zona, the, the sun is female. Der Monk, the moon is male. But I think it's interesting, given what we saw in that Paleolithic chapter about the two Paleolithic cultures of the Ordination, uh, that uh, the French, who have this, the genders reversed, le soleil, uh, the sun is masculine, and la lune, the moon, is feminine. Uh, we saw that early culture divide there with the two, the two different cultures, uh, the western, most of which, centered in and around the Pyrenees, rejected uh, the goddess culture. I think that's an interesting observation. This myth survives where the sun is female and the moon male amongst the Eskimo. A number of the North American tribes have it. Uh, the Andaman Islanders have it. Later, the Hittites have it for the Hittites. Uh, the, even though they were Indo Aryan, the sun also was female for them. And so we have these two different mythogenetic zones he thinks that might be traceable back to the age of Homo erectus man. So stage three is uh, that of Neanderthal man, whom, as we have seen, originated out of Europe. So the primary mythogenetic zone here would be in Europe, where during the last interglacial we saw the emergence of the cave bear cults. Also, we get burial rites and practices with Neanderthal man possibly uh, the birth of ritual cannibalism in association with skull cult worship and or possibly uh, a, a rite associated with the head hunt, which usually goes along with this kind of ancestral uh, worship and ritual cannibalism uh, type thing. So um, that's the Neanderthal mythogenetic zone. And then stage four is, of course, uh, the area <clears throat> in the Ordination zone of the Franco-Cantabrian province. Uh, where the great cave art uh, was. And then the eastern zone, we actually have two uh, separate zones, mythogenetic zones there. The zone that produced the goddess, which we saw the first goddess figurines coming out of Germany, the Venus of Holofels about 37,000 BC, uh, the Venus of Willendorf about 30,000 BC. So this seems to be the mythogenetic zone of the goddess in Germany and in the Ukraine. Whereas in the Franco-Cantabrian province, with the explosion of parietal art, uh, we get the mythogenetic zone uh, for the great hunt, 
but also possibly if Michael Rappenglück is correct, it's also the mythogenetic zone for the zodiac, the earliest origins of thinking and projecting uh, constellations of animals onto the world dome of the ceiling of the night sky. So that may come from that zone. The fifth mythogenetic zone then is the sequel to this, the Spanish Levantine art, which as we have seen last time, takes place around 12,000 to 10,000 BC in Eastern Spain and in North Africa. It's a different people that has come in here. And Campbell thinks this zone might actually extend uh, from North Africa across to the mountains of Persia. In that zone, animal herding, uh, the herding of cattle, sheep, and goats, eventually gave way to animal domestication in that zone, originating uh, with perhaps a spillover or a late echo of the Paleolithic worship of the great animal totems that then migrated into the Sahara and then slowly, be, because the later paintings uh, from areas like the Sahara Atlas Mountains and the Fazan show these very same animals being domesticated already with the cattle, sheep, goats. We also find in that art the ram pictured for the first time with the sun uh, in its horns. So we have the solar ram that eventually migrates into Egypt and becomes there the ram god Amun uh, and so forth. So that's the animal domestication zone. And Campbell thinks that <clears throat> what happened was zone six, which is the, the zone of high civilization and the birth of the hieratic city-state, emerged out of the Fertile Crescent where these two zones crossed, the North African animal herding and domestication zone uh, stretching across that area and the southern equatorial zone of the planting culture complex with the serpent and the maiden. Uh, they overlapped in the Fertile Crescent and when they overlapped, they met and fused together to become mythogenetic zone stage six, the birth of hieratic uh, civilization, which extends from Egypt across to Met Mesopotamia, and gives birth to what Arnold Toynbee called the first generation of civilization, which includes these two behemoths, 3500 BC, Mesopotamia, 3000 BC, Egypt, and their two associated uh, satellite civilizations, another Toynbee term, uh, in the case of Egypt, the satellite civilization circa 2500 BC was Minoan Crete. In the case of Mesopotamia, also circa 25, 2600 BC, the satellite civilization there was Harappan India, old India, which is just right around the corner up the Persian Gulf from Mesopotamia. They were doing lots of trade with, with the Harappan civilization there. So we've got four different uh, societies emerging out of this first generation of civilization. And then Campbell discusses how the motivating um, <clears throat> mythogenetic idea in high civilization has to do with astrology. It has to do with studying the movements of the planets, the rise of mathematics, writing astronomy, the sexagesimal mathematical system, the decimal mathematical system. All of this, everything shifts from the earth as the primary mythological motivation to the heavens. And so we get uh, Sir Leonard Woolley's findings in the 1920s of uh, the death pits of Ur, uh, which have to do with the first dynasty of Ur, circa 2600 BC, where we find uh, the king, the queen, and all of his court uh, massacred all at once, drinking poison, going down and into these huge death pits and having earth simply buried on top of them. And most likely they were enacting some sort of astronomical myth, which, as we have seen when the book started out with the legend of the destruction of Cash, uh, from the Sudan, told to Leo Frobenius by one of his uh, camel drivers, uh, the myth there where the king was put to death every seven years, in accordance in that case probably with Saturn cycles that move every seven years, although it may also be the case that the king incarnates not the moon but Jupiter. Uh, in the case of the Babylonians, it was Marduk. The king was associated with Marduk. Marduk is the planet Jupiter, which goes every 12 years, which seems to have also been the case in India. And then in Egypt, uh, the Sed Festival, where the king's power is renewed, was every 30 years. So it seems to have been plugged in somehow to a complete 29-year uh, Saturn cycle. Either way, it's all astronomical. Astronomy now becomes the motivating principle to organize these gigantic hieratic city-states which come in at this time. And Campbell winds up this section then by quoting uh, the very interesting and fascinating myth of Inanna's descent into the netherworld. Uh, as explaining possibly in a lot of these death pits that Leonard Woolley unearthed, Ur was the city sacred to the moon god Nana Seen. That uh, was the primary divinity there. Uh, in its sister city of Uruk, up the road there, the primary uh, divinities were On, the sky god who was the father of Inanna, uh, who was the planet associated with Venus. Uh, but in the death pits of Ur, it is very possible that uh, we're getting all this enacted with 
some, in some cases, the king might be the moon and his consort, uh, as in the burial of a bargi, uh, he might have been the moon. And then uh, Queen Shabad, whose tomb was buried above his, might have been associated with the sun. And there may have been another consort of the king associated with the planet Venus. Um, but they're all dressed in lots of garb, lots of jewelry, lapis lazuli, carnelian beads, very heavily adorned, very richly adorned. It's a kind of uh, lavish potlatch uh, equivalent. And um, the myth of Anunna's descent to the underworld may help explain and uh, help us to understand uh, the cosmology and mythology of what was going on here, because uh, this myth dates from, uh, most likely from the third dynasty of Ur, the dates for which now are about 2112 BC to 2004 BC, which is the last gasp of Sumerian civilization when they're furiously writing down all their myths and trying to uh, restore them. And in this myth, uh, Inanna, uh, it says, as it begins, um, the mistress of the great above saw the great below and wanted to journey down to the great below. So what we have here is an astronomical myth that has to do with the disappearance of Venus uh, most likely as the evening star, and then her reappearance as the morning star, ultimately heralding the rise of the sun, the last star out at the end of the night heralds the rise of the sun, which may be why Venus is always pictured with one uh, knee cocked up uh, with a lion coming up from beneath her, which may be associated with the sun. She's always Venus and has an eight-pointed star. Venus cycles are every eight years. Um, so she descends down into the underworld. We're not given a reason why. But she descends down into the underworld, and the underworld is called Kur, K-U-R. And it's this vast realm that's made up. Uh, she has to go through seven gates, and she has seven different layers of clothing that she has put on herself, just like the uh, individuals who were buried in the, in the death pits of Ur. And in each one of these levels, she has to surrender some necklace or some breastplate or her hat. Some part of her uh, has to be surrendered as she descends down into the underworld, through these seven distinct levels, which I think then are the uh, they're the underworld equivalent uh, then of the seven heavenly spheres, uh, and this may be the earliest myth that gives us uh, some indication of what later in classical civilization amongst the Greeks and Romans became the myth of the soul's descent through the seven heavenly spheres down towards incarnation in on earth in a physical body that has been garbed Every time the soul arrives at a different planetary sphere, it picks up different qualities. Uh, Venus, it'll pick up the sex drive. Mars, it'll pick up its warrior aspects. Mercury, it'll pick up its intellect and so forth through each one of these spheres so that another layer is added of densification and materiality is added to the soul as it uh, finally achieves incarnation on Earth. Here in this myth, uh, which dates from something like uh, 2000 BC, um, all that happens in reverse. Because as Inanna goes down to journey to her sister Ereshkigal, and there uh, Ereshkigal is the mistress of the underworld. She's the underworld mirror of Inanna. Inanna is the mistress of the great above. Her sister Ereshkigal is the mistress of the great below. And the two of them represent the ancient archetype of the double goddess that emerged out of the Neolithic, the goddess of the above, the goddess of the below. Later they'll be Demeter and Persephone. Um, <clears throat> so she journeys down and surrenders some at each one of the gates she has to give the attendant a bribe to get to the next gate until she's gone through all seven planetary spheres. And that may be then the explanation for what happens in the death pits with all the regalia, why everyone is dressed wearing so much costly jewelry and so forth. These are bribes. They're going to be brides as these souls go through the seven gates of the underworld. They're going to have to bribe each attendant to let them pass as they go through these subterranean equivalents of the seven heavenly spheres. Finally, she gets down there, and it says uh, that her body is hung up on a meat hook. Note then that two things about this myth. Number one is that the earliest myth of the hero's descent to the underworld is that of a woman. This is the earliest one, as far as we know, Inanna. Number two, the earliest image of a crucifixion is that of a woman. Inanna is basically hanging on the meat hook, the first prototypal image of the crucifixion. Um, and the death and res resurrection motif that later, out of the Levant, out of the Middle East, uh, resurrects all this and associates it with the dying and reviving God, of whom Christ then becomes the historical uh, realization or manifestation of. Um, once she's down there, uh, her attendant, Ninjabur, sometimes this attendant uh, 
uh, is male, sometimes female, we're not sure. Uh, she has Ninchabor, but her father On also has Ninchabor. It seems like he has a male a version of Ninchabor. She has a female equivalent of Ninchabor. Ninchabor is the messenger of the gods. This is the equivalent of Mercury Hermes. She has told Ninchabor uh, before she made the descent that if she's gone for longer than three days, Ninchabor needs to send the gods to come get her. So Ninchabor goes up and talks to the great high god Enki and says, I'm worried about Inanna. She's been missing too long. Can we bring her back? So Enki takes some dirt from underneath his fingernails, and he creates two creatures. Um, and from each of these creatures, he gives one the waters of eternal life, and he gives the other the food of eternal life. And he says, go down there, give Inanna's body these things, and uh, it will resurrect her. So these two creatures go down there, and they see her body hanging on the meat hook, and they throw the water on her, the waters of life, and they offer her the food. And note that I think uh, this is a, a later substitution and development for what would have been um, in the ancient burials that we have seen in the Paleolithic as far back in Palestine as 100,000 BC, where the body is covered with red ochre. The sprinkling of the red ochre on the body is the thing that would resurrect the body. And I think here the red ochre has been substituted for the waters of eternal life and the food of eternal life to resurrect the dead body. And it does indeed resurrect her, but they won't let her leave the underworld until her semiotic vacancy there is replaced. She has to find a replacement. So she goes up and she checks with a number of gods, all of whom have been doing proper mourning for her absence. So she leaves them alone until she gets to her spouse, Demuzi. Anana is no goddess of marriage. She's a goddess of prostitution. She never has children. She's the goddess of sexuality and war, uh, primarily sexuality. The planet Venus and its association with sexuality is very old. And Demuzi, though, is a temporary spouse. Uh, he wasn't mourning. He was partying while she was gone. So they send up uh, a couple of Galu demons to go and get him, and they haul him off and drag him down to the underworld to occupy the semiotic vacancy that she has come out of. And then his sister is Geshtanana, and she, she's the goddess of wine, by the way. She goes down there, and, and the two of them then trade out. Every six months, one is allowed to come back to this world for six months. Then they have to trade out six months, just like with Persephone. Uh, coming up with a third of the year. Uh, it's a seasonal myth. And so this is the myth, the great astronomical myth of the disappearance of Venus on the western horizon at night, going through the underworld and becoming resurrected as morning star heralding the rise of the sun. And this may be a very key important myth coding for those death pits uh, that Sir Leonard Woolley found at Ur. Uh, and so we'll leave it there with uh, that material for the first half of this chapter.